right to start. Thank you. I would like to start. Uh, as you see, I'm alone today. Um, Rüdiger and me uh, will alternate, so I will do this uh, next week, and then there's going to be two weeks or something by Rüdiger and so on and so on. So you will probably not see all of us uh, for all the time. Okay, before I start, there's one thing I've always wanted to do, and that is I would like for somebody to interrupt me in this very sentence while I'm still speaking this sentence. I have to continue the sentence for a very long time. So I want to show you guys that you can interrupt me at any time. And for this, please don't interrupt me yet. Thank you. <laughs> Woo, it worked. OK, so uh, please interrupt me at any time. OK, um, next thing. Uh, the homework script uh, expectedly uh, needs some fine tuning. Or uh, well, it's just the fact that I don't have any internet right now, so I can't uh, tell you if it actually even works. Uh, so. I will provide that probably uh, some time this evening. So you get an email if you pass the first normal exercise and the first bonus exercise probably this evening. Okay, did anybody have major problems with the homework, with uh, the process of submitting and so on, which was not resolved via email or via the forum? Okay, that's good. Uh, there are some problems with that which we can't resolve, which I will explain in a second. Uh, okay, but then let's start actually with the first homework. Okay, so this was um, the first thing. So imagine, is this? No, probably not. I'm working on that. Okay, um, so imagine this was your first homework. Um, still can't read. Still can't read. Yeah, can we do about that? How can I even close that? How can I even close that? Let them press the bottom. Oh, yeah. Somehow like this. Yo. Ah, probably works, right? Okay. Um. So now. Matching this being your first attempt at the first homework. So the first homework obviously only had to uh, print hello world. Imagine uh, this is your first homework. Now if we run in the correct folder. So as there were some people who had problems with uh, working with the terminal, and I think it's generally important to know how that stuff works, I will explain something about the shell, which will probably take around 20 minutes. Uh, because this lecture is pretty tight in schedule, I will do it at the end, and it may be later than uh, quarter to four. So um, I will do that in the end, and if you want to see that and you think it's necessary for you, you could stay then, and otherwise you can just leave before I give you time to leave. Okay, anyway, um, I need to make that probably bigger too. All right, uh, so imagine you tried to do it, uh, you wrote hello world, happy smiley, and then you run PyTest, and then this here is your error. Um, how to read this error? Well, the assertion here says hello world with a smiley backslash n equals hello world backslash n, and that here then failed. The input is this, and what it was expecting was this. So this backslash n means a uh, new line. This is in every programming language the same. I assume you just know that. And now, if you didn't, you know it now. So what you need to do to fix here, apparently, is uh, you write this string in exactly the way we wanted to have it, uh, which is simply hello world. So if I now run PyTest again, it's green. And if I now uh, git add, git commission, and git push it, um, there should be the green mark. Um, okay, so to get where I'm pushing, I can use git config minus minus get remote dot origin dot URL. Um, this tells me the um, domain I would push to. Um, if this would be the result of yours, uh, then you're wrong, because this is a public repository where you don't have uh, the right to write. 
Instead, it should be your personal one. And if you, uh, if this is your repository to push to, uh, in the forum, there was a discussion on how to resolve that. Okay, then if we uh, copy the domain of that, and, oops, what did I, what is it, never So if you use the HTTPS link, uh, it works perfectly. If you use the uh, do CSSL link, you need to change the first part of the domain with that. Uh, okay, and now imagine you push, and then you look at the commits, and then there should be your green, um, your green mark. Uh, sometimes, it were in three homeworks, um, even though your PyTest the PyTest passed locally, there wasn't a green mark here. Um, that's an issue, unfortunately, of um, the uh, of of uh, Travis, which uh, which we use to test if the homework passes or fails, or with GitHub Plus. We don't know actually where this issue comes from. It's because so it's the fact that Travis didn't get your um, your key, uh, didn't get the key to your repository, the SSH key, such that it can't clone the repository. And there's nothing you can do about it. The only thing is you tell you have to tell us, and then we add this key manually. Don't know what that is. That's in like one percent of cases. So if you if you're sure it has to pass, then please send me an email and please uh, send me a screenshot of your locally passing um, PyTest such that I know it's actually an issue. Okay, good. Um, next up was the primes exercise. Uh, yes, sure. So if we accepted the bonus homework, but we didn't do, we didn't do it, then uh, would we get some minus points or something? No. It's simply, so if you didn't accept it, it's the same if you, I mean, you probably get minus points if you cheat. I don't know if anybody cheated because the script is not usable. No, I just accepted, then I... No, that doesn't change it. So accepting but not doing the homework is the same as not accepting the homework. That doesn't matter. Okay, um... Okay, uh, imagine this being your solution so far for the second homework for the primes. So I now want PyTest here. Uh, there are some assertion errors. So let's go how to read an assertion error again. So I said it last week, but maybe it was not clear enough. So what PyTest does is if you execute it in the folder, it looks at all Python files that are called test underscore something and in all those files, um, it looks for all method, for all functions called uh, test underscore something without parameters and executes them. Okay, so you can't run uh, Python test underscore prime.py that won't help you have to run PyTest. Okay, um, so imagine we have the result of our PyTest here. In the first testing method, which is test is prime method, it uh, got to uh, this line here, and then it was assert false. Assert false is bad, because as soon as you did that, there's something wrong with your code. And then it tells you that, well, what is false? The result of your function is prime with the parameter two is false, and this function is the prime dot is prime. So what it says here is that prime dot is prime two had to be true, but instead is false. Okay, why is that? Well, because we're checking if the number is divisible by two in this case. Okay, so what this what we do here is we well one is not a prime, so we check false for one, we check if the number is divisible by two, or we check if the number ends in five. This is a quick check for uh, or for even numbers and for numbers ending in five. And then we uh, go through a loop and test some other numbers that we get to that in a second. However, we test if the number is divisible by two, two is divisible by two, so it says it's not a prime, a prime, so what we do. What we have to do here, <coughs> so we simply return uh, true for two and five in this case. Uh, returning in a function also exits out of function. So as soon as we return here, the part below the return uh, is not executed anymore. Okay, so imagine this was uh, imagine this was all fixed so far. Oops, I test. Okay, now we have another error. 
and that is um, that we assert none here. Um, in Python, if so obviously we don't specify what the return value of a function is in Python, and if we don't return anything, Python implicitly returns none. So here PyTest told us the result for um, the parameter, whatever this number here is, is none. As we don't uh, explicitly return none anywhere, it probably means that our script got uh, to the end uh, without returning. So if we tried all those numbers, and it's not divisible by all those numbers, what we simply do, so we return true, because if it's not divisible, then it's a try. Then it's a try. Why? OK, now um, there are no failures in the test is prime method. So we're 100% certain, well, not 100, because maybe our test script wasn't good enough. But assuming the test script captures all cases, we know that our is prime method is written in stone, and we don't need to change it anymore at all. Okay. Now we have some failures in the uh, find prime method, um, and that well, that is that our uh, script doesn't have a find prime method, where we can just uh, imagine we have it, and now it works. Okay. So to get uh, through the code, like I said, we test for two and five. And then we start, so we could, in theory, just go for i in a uh, range between 2 and the number minus 1. And if it's not divisible by any of those, then it's a prime. We can make it a bit smarter, which is what I did here. And that is, uh, we test for two ones, and then we don't need to test for 4, 6, 8, and all even numbers anymore, because if something is divisible by 16, it's also divisible by 2, right? So we just go through the odd numbers here, which is why we start at 3, and we increment in two steps. So two, five, uh, seven, and so on. And then you could think, well, a number, so 100 is in any case not divisible by 99. So one thing we could do is to test only until 50, because the maximum a number is divisible with is uh, the half of it. However, 100 divis divided by 50 is 2. 100 divided by 2 is 50. Okay, so we have one big and one small one, and they come to each other exactly at the square root. 100 divided by 10 is 10 and you won't get any bigger than that. So we don't need to test until the square root of the number, uh, because in Python, the range is exclusive. We need to have the plus one here. And that's already some uh, ways to make that smarter. And then we check if the rest of the division is zero, and if it, and if it in fact is, um, then it was divisible by that number, and return false. And otherwise, we just return to it. And then the find prime method, um, just as an infinite loop here, testing, counting how many primes we had already. So we start with the number two. If the number, if, uh, the number two is, um, is a prime number, we increase two was the first one, and then three was the second one, and so on and so on, until we got, until the number so far of prime numbers we had is the number of the prime we wanted to have, and if so, we return this very prime number, and it's not being used. Any questions on the semantics of the homework? No. Did anybody do something much smarter, much smarter than this, like using the C for Eratosthenes or whatever other things I had in the link I posted? OK. Um, good. As much for that. Then I would just start with the actual basic Python. So. Uh, for those of you who are already quite familiar with Python, uh, this may be a bit boring and slow at the beginning, but we want to get everyone on the same page. Um, and this is basically, uh, let's call it advanced understanding of uh, basic Python. Okay, I will just, this is what we're going to do in every lecture from now on probably. Uh, we're going to go through this notebook, which we will also um, uh, uh, upload on StudyP. Go through everything, there may be some questions in there, and so on. Yeah? Is this an idea of code? No, it's not. Oh, that could have been an idea. Uh, I will do that from next week on. But I'm not, I will do that from next week on, if that's OK. I will, I will add stuff in here if uh, something comes up anyway. OK. So Python. Uh, in Python, everything is an object. So. There are no, in Java, you may know that there are primitives and non-primitives, and an int is a primitive in Java, which means ex exactly this value and not more. In Python, everything is an object. 
Okay, we have, so we have, we have the basic types, which are uh, ins, floats, booleans, and strings, which are a bit different, uh, which are handled a bit differently, but everything is an object. We'll get to what the, what the result of everything being an object is in a second. I hope so. Didn't think about that. How big should I have to go? That's really big. Okay, uh, by the way, if you don't know this, this is Jupyter Lab. It's the new shit. Um, and it basically, it is simply like Jupyter Notebook, except that you um, can have, for example, as you saw here, multiple tabs, can have a console run, a terminal running at the same time, and so on, so on. So this is Jupyter Notebook in better. Okay, so everything is an object, and uh, we can see so by just having here, we have numbers, and the type of the number is it's an int. Uh, Booleans are case object. Okay, uh, who knows what the biggest int uh, is I can do in Python? If you don't, what's an educated guess? Yeah. Uh, I think there is no limit. Ah, there's no limit, true. In Python 3, there is no limit. Uh, you may think an educated guess would be um, 2 to the power of the word size of the, of the system. So if you have a 64-bit 60, system, you may think it's 2 to the power of 64 divided by 2 minus 1, because that's the biggest one you can do with 64 bits. However, um, there is still this dot max size, which is a fairly big number, but Python we doesn't matter at all anymore. Uh, it doesn't care about that anymore. You can just uh, make. Oops. You can just have arbitrarily big numbers. So I don't know how to call that number. Python is fine with that. Actually, calculating it is really fast. If I could also calculate to the power of 999 again. Uh, printing would become a problem eventually, so I won't uh, do that anymore, okay? Uh, so, we can go as big as we want. Python internally changes something there, but um, if we print the type of it, uh, it's still an int. Okay, uh, strings. Um, first of all, if you're coming from Java, you may know that there's a character, car. In Python, there's not character. There is no character. A character is just a string with only one, with length one. Um, and yeah, so can use single or double quotes, doesn't matter. Um, you can also use quotation marks in the string, then you just need to use the other ones. And if you want to use both kinds of uh, quotation marks in strings, you can just use three quotation marks. And you can also make a multi-line comment, for example, with three quotation marks and doc strings, which we will get to later. Um, but yeah, and if you have three quotation marks, you can also make uh, uh, line character jobs. Yes? How does Python know if it's a comment or a string if you have three quotation marks? If you assign it somewhere, if it's somewhere in the code. So it depends on the position. If it's, so it's a comment if it's just somewhere. It, it's not actually really a comment, it just happens to be possible that you can just type it somewhere. Um, normally, it's a doc string. If it's at the beginning of a function, uh, then it will, or a class, then Python will know it's a doc string. Okay. Um, each object has a certain type that determines the properties. And um, as, as I said, everything is an object, including Booleans. So if it wouldn't be an object, I wouldn't be able to uh, dereference functions from here, methods from here. Okay, so while a Boolean could, in theory, be only one bit, uh, Python is good and uh, user-friendly, uh, but inefficient in the sense that even a Boolean has many functions. Okay, so we will get to what this two dot uh, underscore underscore uh, abs underscore underscore is later on. So if you want to know what all the methods and attributes of anything is, you can type uh, dear and then uh, whatever type of attribute is. And then you will see that even a Boolean has actually quite many functions. Okay. Well, printing things. Oops. Not again. Printing things. Uh, well, we can obviously print objects using a print function. Now I said print function, and if you're used to Python 2, which I hope you're not, and if you're still using, so here you have to use Python 3, and if you're used to using Python 2, don't. Um, Python 2 will end in about one year, finally, and please don't make uh, the 
progress of the world, uh, please don't stop the progress of the world by scaling those buttons with outdated. Okay? In Python 2, print was a keyword, which meant you didn't need the parentheses, and you could just print space something. That has the advantage that you don't have to write the parentheses, and everything else of that is a disadvantage. So um, we will get la later in the script why that is better now um, that it's a function, and that is we can, for example, overwrite it. Okay, but yeah, we can just print everything, can print ints, floats, booleans, doesn't matter. Uh, why can we do that? Because when printing things, uh, Python internally converts everything what comes in there to strings using the str function. Okay, so, um, and if you use, and if you uh, look at what str and then something returns, well, it's of type string. So one is of type int, but string of one is obviously of type string. Okay, why did that? Yeah, it wasn't supposed to, oh, I didn't define the, I deleted the image. I deleted C2. Okay, oh yeah, it was this humongously big number. Okay, you can print several things at once. And note that this is also a really good feature of Python. You can just have as many, arbitrarily many arguments in a function. As far as I know, that doesn't work in Java, and that's a really interesting and cool thing of Python. We get later on why we can do that. Okay, objects alone don't make much sense. Uh, we need variables. In Python, variables, um, work different than in other languages like Java. As I said, everything is an object. And also Python uses, uh, has um, uh, dynamic typing, which means that in Python, so first of all, well, I can obviously assign um, anything to a variable, and then this variable is of type whatever I assign to it. But in Python, you can reassign variables with every type I want. So I can define, I can say A is an integer, which it shows me where it's an int, and then I can reassign it um, as a string. <coughs> this wouldn't be possible in, in Java, obviously, because you would have to say it's a, a reference of type int, and then if you want to assign a string to a reference of type int, that doesn't work anymore. Okay, um, I'll explain more on that in a second. First of all, strings are immutable. So this here would change the second character of the string, uh, which doesn't work, and Python tells us, nah, I can't do that because the string doesn't support item assignment. That's assignment. That's called immutable. Okay, so assume we execute this. Who can tell me what the value of b is now? Okay, it's just one is assigned to a, and then b equals a, and then we reassign a. Yes, then. Uh, it's one. Um, so, why is that? Because in Python we have well, the objects and we have a name. name. Okay, and if we do a equals one, we create a name and we create an object and we assign this name to this object in our current namespace which is right now the entire script because we're not somewhere else. Okay, and if I now make, uh, if I now uh, say b equals a, I create a new name b, and as it equals a, I just let it point uh, to this value. If I now write a equals two, the name exists already, but I create a new object two, and I just assign the name a to that new object. So now b still, points to one, the name of B still stands, uh, the name B is still connected to the object one, and the name A is connected to the object um, two. This changes a few things in how things work. So if you remember that from uh, Java, for, uh, for we had the difference um, between primitive types and non-primitive types. In Python, we don't have that difference anymore. Yes. Yeah. Because um, ints are immutable and this are mutable. I will get to that in a second. So the only distinction, there's no distinction between primitive, there is no thing as primitive types in Python, 
everything is an object. Everything is an object. Um, it's just the fact that um, some things are immutable and others aren't. I know I said raw and white here, so I probably have to write somewhere here. Uh -huh. So what I want to write here is uh, that strings, boolean, uh, ins and floats, oh, that's, uh, that's a German word, <laughs> are immutable. However, their variable, or let's rather call it name, is mutable. So I can change so I can change the name here to point to something else. However, the actual object is immutable. Okay, so a really important concept for Python is, I will just, I have it here such that I don't explain it wrong, typing. And that is Python is, as I said, it's dynamically typed, but it's strongly typed. This may sound uh, like a contradiction, but it works. Because if we assign some variable, if we assign three to one variable, some variable and then assign another thing, um, the name changed. Okay, so uh, in the first line, the name variable is bound to an integer object, and then we bind the name to a new thing, string object. Python's dynamically typed because we can do that, and we can pass all reference and check only at the very end what type it is, if even. That's another concept I'm going to explain later on. But it's strongly typed because objects don't change types. So this int object is still an int object, and this string object is still a string object. And those two also don't change. That's why it's uh, strongly typed. However, we can just reassign and do what we want, and that's why it's dynamically typed. Questions to that? That's a concept we will need later, and that has implications in later on, too. Yes? Uh, can you go up a bit? Okay. So in here, the arrow can be pointing to the object one, right? Is there yes. A Uh, only by using a web So, I mean, we did so. It pointed. No, as far as I know, not only if you use a wrapper class, but then you have something mutable, and that's still not the name. Names are something else than objects, and names are basically not accessible, as far as I know. So, there has to be a, there is always, always a connection between an object and a name. Yes, you can't, as far as I know, you can't connect names to names. Yes? Um, so here for the variable, if you were to, I don't know, say print variable at this point, it would only print hello, or what would it? Yes. So it no longer is even assigned to free at all? Like the object free yeah. is just... Um, well, that's the concept of garbage collection. Um, so in this case here, we assigned A to, we assigned uh, the object 1 to the name A, and we assigned 2 to B. And now there's still uh, something connected here, so the object is not garbage collected yet, it's still there. But if we did now, um, if we now say uh, b equals 3, then we would lose this here because look, b is now connected to this 3. And eventually, there's no name for the object 1 here anymore, and that will eventually get garbage connected. So um, it's, it's not under that name anymore. It's, it, there's still a reference to it, a name for it, it still exists, but um, it's not under that name anymore now. Okay, so there would be no, at this point, if we never had saved the other. The three is just gone. It just gets okay. garbage collected any some time. As soon as the Python garbage collector thinks it's a good idea to, to do so. Sorry. Yeah. I got confused. Are uh, names mutable or objects? Objects are in, uh, So here the string object, yeah, strings, booleans, ints, and floats are immutable. The name is mutable. So we can change, we can reassign the name to something else. Let's get to that later. Uh, I will get to that later. Okay, um, basic operations. Well, we now store variables. Uh, we can't do any program with that. We want to well, perform some operations and manipulate those objects. So there are three ways to manipulate things to bring action into a program. Uh, the first one, which is actually a special case of the later ones, so we'll get to that later, uh, is just using an operator. Using an operator, right? Um, those are the normal operators that work on integers. You can add numbers, subtract, and so on and so on. There's an operator for to be power off. Uh, that's two stars. Note that the um, carrot symbol is a big voice extra. If you don't know what that is, just Google it. Uh, the normal division, integer division, which will always return an integer, 
and Bordeaux, divided into term remainder. Um, if you want to uh, reassign something, you may know that Java has uh, A++ and A++A. That operator doesn't exist in Python, but you can use A plus equals 1, or A times equals something. And if we now do that, well, obviously, those all behave as expected. Um, what's, however, uh, relevant is that in Java, the distinction of when um, the division uh, lead it to an integer and when lead to a float dependent on the types. In Python, that doesn't. So a here is an integer, b here is an integer, but the division a divided by b can be a float. In Java, you would have to add 0.1 to some of the variables to make sure that Java does the float division of the integer division. In Python, integer division is just uh, just this sign. The float division is always this sign, no matter what the input type is. Okay. Uh, there were operators for ints, there are also or in floats, there are also operators for strings. We can, for example, add strings with a plus sign. We can use times for strings, which makes sense some time, I guess. Can't divide um, or multiply with fractions, obviously. Um, Boolean operators uh, can compare two things, where this is obvious, right? As a bigger than b, which means Boolean, and as a is two and b is three. A is smaller or equal to B, and A is not B, and A is on B exists. Okay, we can assign the result of such a comparison again to a variable. We can say A is assigned the result of the Boolean operation if one is bigger than three. So A here is false. We can even omit the parentheses and can say B is the result of the Boolean operation if three is equal to three, which it is. So A is false, B is true. You can just look at these. Yes, A is in fact false, and B is true. And there was a Boolean operators, or and is and it's not. Um, sorry. Oh. Uh, can you also assign uh, something to like uh, like to an if else or something? So if you say uh, a is, then you have an if inside of it or something. Um, lambda expressions, I'd say. What? Um, you can have a function which you can just uh, then assign. You can also have a lambda expression, which is a small function, which does the same. Uh, yes, you can, but we will get to that later. And if the question, if you feel the question isn't answered by then, uh, just ask me again later. Okay, so for atomic types, as the ones we had so far, we can simply use, we can safely use is, um, otherwise we have to use equals equals, so we'll get to the difference of is and equals equals later. And yes, um, yeah, they're also, the pipe and the end sign, which you may know from Java, equal for Booleans, as they are binary bitwise uh, differently for strings. It's not clear yet. We will, so this was only using operators. We'll get to how these operators work later on, because it's the major thing about the Python data concept. Okay, next thing to operate on stuff are functions. Uh, functions, well, duh, right? I assume you all know what functions are and do. Uh, we can we have so checking the type of something which we used already as a function. Len checks the length of the length of something, rounds, rounds, and so on, so on. There are functions <laughs> where probably won't break much sense without functions, right? Um, if we want to find out what a function does, we can simply um, enter the name of the function, then a question mark, which will show us the doc string. And that normally shows uh, how to use it. So round takes as an argument a number takes as uh, optional second argument the number of digits and returns a number. So round 3.14159, et cetera, uh, to two digits uh, leads to 3.14. can also use uh, start typing it with the parenthesis and then type tap, um, which will show us what we can put in there. But because uh, Python is dynamically typed, can put basically anything in there because Python doesn't know if it's applicable or not. Um, so that makes more or less sense. But question mark, really useful thing to do. Okay, then one major difference from Python to Java. Java is, as you know, an object-oriented language. Python is too, but Python has many other concepts. From, so Python has influences from many different types of programming languages. For example, functional programming languages. And because of that, I know Java 8 kind of does it too, but worse than Python. Um, and in Python, Functions are first class objects. We can assign a function to a variable. 
So from now on, I will call it probably names most of the time variables, but you know what I mean. Okay, and then if we run A with some parameters, um, well, what, what is the result of that? Well, the same as if we would have one print, because A is now print. Okay, so what is A now? It's of type built-in function print. So A is the built-in function print, which is of the class built-in function or method. Uh, there are many built-in functions or methods, for example, print, type, len, etc. Okay, and if we want to know if some variable is actually a functional method, um, the term for both functional methods are callables, you can check if it has the attribute, has a true um, call. We will get to why that works later on. So all, if a variable is of type function or method, then it has the attribute call, and this is how we can check it. Okay, uh, who can tell me what this line will, oh wait, I already wrote what it is. So if we print here something, and then we print now that line, there's an empty line in between. You can tell me what it is. Yes? Because um, Python does not have the function print line, so whenever you use two print functions and you write them in separate lines, then this is in interpreted by printing two new lines. And but, but how many print functions are called here? Uh, three. Three. Yes, exactly. We, sorry, you did mean it. So A here is now the print function. So first of all, we print this with a new line. Then we evaluate this function. And when evaluating it, we're printing nothing because it's empty parameters, which you need to empty line. And then we take the result of this function, which is none because print doesn't return anything. And then we print this. So this is why we have three lines. There are three print functions in here. Okay, and because um, functions in Python are first class objects, um, we can even use them as parameters for functions. So this function here yeah, takes uh, a number and a function and applies, so uses, uh, uh, calls that function with the number we had. And we can call this function with the function round, and we call this function with the function absolute value, and in one case it will round the number, in the one case it will turn the absolute value. Okay, oh yeah, before I forget, uh, PEP8 naming convention, uh, function names are written in snake case. Do that all the time. Class names are, by the way, written in camel case. Okay, as uh, so much for that. Um, next up, methods. Well, what are methods? We already said everything is an object, and objects contain data and behaviors. Something with the data and some methods to work on the data. Functions that operate on that data. Yes? Um, if I do give, like, can you go up to the example you have before with the function and the number? I don't know what kind of function I will get with that, right? So if the function <coughs> what that I get doesn't take in numbers, like, like what I get, is, is um, that a but there's something I keep forgetting, and that is the question was um, Python doesn't know what kind of function this is or what this yeah. is entirely, and what happens if it's wrong? Um, well, we will get we will cross that bridge when we get to it, which is actually a major problem of Python. Um, I will explain later how how Python deals with that. So we could check if it's a callable. We could check if it accepts integers more or less. But Pythonic way is just not doing it, just trying it, and if it fails, just saying. Uh, just uh, catching that exception. Um, we will get to that later. Okay, uh, methods. So objects have attributes and methods. Uh, for example, strings have many methods. So imagine we assigned a string here. You see it's a string, and now we can call many functions from that string. So we can use dot capitalize, dot replace, dot lower, dot upper, and so on and so on. So strings, a string object, has many methods. And we just showed that strings are obviously an object because if they weren't, if it would be primitive, uh, they, wouldn't be, they wouldn't have uh, any methods. Okay, and if we want to know what methods um, a class has, uh, then we can just, again, to show you already the dear command, 
Um, this will just show all the methods that um, ignore the double underscore ones for now. We'll get to that later. Uh, but here are the normal methods you can call uh, from strings. And if you want to know what they do, you can use the head command for that method, and that tells us where the built-in function is alpha of a string, method of buildings.string, uh, returns a boolean, returns two if all characters of the string are alphabetic, and there's at least one character, or otherwise. So there are many built-in functions, and often when programming, you reinvent the wheel. Uh, looking at the documentation makes really much sense to know uh, how to do things easily. Okay, uh, integers, as we see, don't have a capitalized method, for example, and if you try to call it, it gives us an attribute error. Um, we could have also looked if capitalized is a deal of an integer um, to not call an error, but it's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Um, okay, as much for operators, functions, and methods. Um, now we get to collections, uh, with which Dr. Malta already asked me about. So Python has a number of objects to handle collections of objects. The easiest one, uh, the most handiest one are, are lists. So in a list, we can just have to write them with square brackets. We just put anything in there, and it's a list. Okay, Python doesn't care what uh, types of objects are inside the list, so we can put in there strings, ints, floats, booleans, strings again, other lists, or just random objects. Python just accepts it, and it's just all in there. And yes, in lists, uh, you can get the individual elements uh, with square brackets, why and how, later. And then we'll just return the element at that position. Note that we're counting zero, not at one. We are not MATLAB, we are real programming language here. Okay, something which is also quite nice in Python is that um, you can access the negative index. So you can print the last item by getting, by indexing it at a negative one, and the penultimate one by indexing it negative two. Uh, next up is slicing. So imagine we have this list B here, which contains those 10 elements, and we can slice that. And the slice is just a certain type of object, so something which is written in that way. Uh, square bracket open, some integer, uh, colon integer is a slice. And if a slice is used as index for a string, then it will return, it will slice that string. So this here is b from the zeroth element on until excludingly the second. So this will return the sublist containing zero and one. Um, slices don't need both, don't both boundaries, so we can just type b until mm -hmm, until the end. So we'll just start indexing at b. Uh, we don't even need the other boundary. Uh, so uh, b uh, with only the colon uh, returns the entire b. However, it doesn't return the object b itself, but it returns the so-called soft copy. Okay, so this, if we type uh, we check, check for equalness. Um, right. oh. um, they are the same, but they are not. English is so. Why, why is they not so gleich? And they, are, they, are, they are the gleiche, but they are not the same. Right? They are not the very same, but they are just have equal attributes. <laughs> why is there no word for that in English? Um, okay, we can slice until a negative one, that gives us all until the last one. And if we have a third parameter for the slice object after the second colon, then this is um, in what increments we go forward. So slice, so if we slice B from the second object on until exclusively the eighth, but only every, taking only every other one, then we have two for eight. Okay, yes. No, 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 it's soft copy means, um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's just two different lists. They are just, you can, so it, a soft list doesn't exist. Soft copy just means that you copy all the elements, but it's not quite a deep copy. Um, it doesn't matter, it's a copy. So if you assign that something else, it's a normal list, but it's not the same as uh, the original one. 
Okay, um, as lists of objects, we of course have methods, we can append, we can append another list, we can uh, pop. Python doesn't have a real concept of stacks and so on, but this just, you use a list for everything, so Python doesn't forbid you much. So if you want to have a stack, you can do so, but you can also use a list as a stack if you think it's efficient enough. Okay, so popping it uh, just re returns the last one and removes it from there. Oh, by the way, as you see here, we can just, uh, if we, in Jupyter Notebook, so you can print two things, and if in Jupyter Notebook you just have two things written at the end of your line, then we just output them as a tuple. What's a tuple? One second. Okay, in case you were wondering, it's because now we, ex now we appended another list, which is in there as one object, right? We can also extend by a list, and then where you go through the individual objects, and then just append each of those individually. Lists have the same operator strings, we can use the times and the plus operator. Yes? But I can't put a function into a list. You can put a function, oh yes, I forgot that. As an example, you can, uh, let's do it here. Oh, I need to show it. Functions are objects, and because I can um, append any object to a list, I can also append a function. Okay, um, yes, we get the length of a list by using len and then the list that's in it. Uh, by the way, you can also slice strings just like you can slice um, lists. So A until the exclusively fifth sign, if A was hello word, is uh, hello. Okay, so lists are, as I mentioned already, only the name. So if you have a list, if you have a reference of type list, it doesn't exist in Python, but if you have a list, then what you have is actually only the name of the list, referencing to the data and not the data itself. So what happens, oh shit, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> um, let's imagine we just didn't see that. So what happens when we do this here to a list? So what will the result of B later will be? Uh, first element will be cheesecake. Why that? Because uh, lists are mutable in contrast to um, integers. So we had the name A. Um, so here we have the name A. We have somehow the object list. And A now points to that list. Say so B equals A, we create the name B that also points to the list. And then if we change A, and doing it, zero, we change that here to cheesecake, where B still points to it. Because strings are, because lists are mutable. We can change it in place, we do change it in place, and then just, uh, and then um, the other one also points to that. Because lists are mutable, we can perform, perform changes to a list and list. So if we didn't want to do that, we would have to make a deep copy, or a soft copy, um, of that list. So I use deep copy here. So in lists, in the case of lists, a deep, uh, soft copy works. It doesn't work all the time. That's why uh, I just wanted to come here. So deep copy is in the model copy. So we can from copy and import deep copy. And if we make D, B a deep copy of A, what we do here, so first of all, we have the list A. It points to one, two, one, two, uh, banana, three. If we make then B a deep copy B, we make the name B, we make a deep copy of that, which creates a new list, a new object. We put it here, and if we now change A in zero, again to cheesecake, uh, B didn't change. Same holds in the case of this for a soft copy. If I would write um, B equals uh, A colon. I wouldn't work the same way. Yes? Uh, but we would define A to an entirely new list. So we then, well, B, B wouldn't change that anymore, right? Um, like, no, then we would get, um, well, in this case here with the deep copy, we just lose the original object. And the version gets gone. Okay, okay for the original one. So if we assign, if we assign A a new list, but then B still points to the old one, yeah. and A points to a new one, 
and uh, B wouldn't have changed. Yes. Um, another problem uh, when adding objects to lists is this here. If we make a list like this, so we create a list by this here, so a list of containing an empty list times 10, uh, this creates this here, a list of 10 empty lists. However, this here is the very same object, just selbe, um, all 10 times. So if we append something to the first one, it depends on every single one. Because they are all just names for the very same object. Okay? Side effects. This is something which will probably occur to you sooner or later and you don't know why and you hate your life, but it was, looks like this. Okay, to check if a list contains a value, we use the in operator. So banana in list A, I think, yeah, banana is here. Yes. Why would it? No. You can tell it explicitly to do so. Uh, True. I don't know why it doesn't. Uh, probably because this is intended for many intents and purposes too. Okay, um, what will this here return? So we have a string with the name, so the string contains fruit. The name of that is some guy. We create a new list, first names. We append this some guy and make another list of names, which is the uh, first. We append to that another guy. We add the name some guy. We change uh, it to another third guy, and then we print everything. So what does some? What is some guy now? Yes. Bill. Some guy is not Bill. Right. What is the list of first names? Yes. Fred and George. Fred and George. And the list of other names? Another list of names? Same. Same. Right. So we changed the sum guy to Bill, but those two are still the very same one, the selber. And um, they contain um, Fred <coughs> because we added him here and George because we added him here. Yes. You can use the same and equal. Yeah, I know that I can use the same and equal, but. I want to explain what the difference between the same and equal is by using the words the same and equal. I, I, get, I get what you mean. Yeah, we'll use the same and equal from now on, and I will define that same thing in Python later on. Okay, tuples um, are the cousins of lists um, with the only difference that they are immutable. Um, if we want to create a tuple, uh, we just use uh, round parentheses instead of square brackets. And the difference between, or you just don't use them at all, and the difference between tuples and lists is that tuples are immutable. Okay? Uh, and we can even omit uh, the parentheses. So if I just assign one, two, three to a value, I implicitly make a tuple out of that, and now it's just a tuple containing one, two, three. Um, if we, for example, um, are in a function and we return one, two, three, which is possible in a the function, then you just return a tuple containing one, two, three, because commas and no brackets around that is the Python syntax for, hey, this is a tuple. Okay. Um, but yeah, we can, uh, we can clone that. And now, if we try to uh, change the value of that, uh, it doesn't work because tuples are immutable. Um, oh yeah, that's what I did here too. Okay, um, you get a feeling when you want to use tuples, you use tuples when you want to make sure that it's not changed. And um, yeah, that's basically it. Okay, uh, name tuples uh, are more unknown than the other ones, and they are not that big or make big of a change, they're just, they're just really handy. And a name tuple is something that well, can be accessed the same way as a tuple, it internally is a tuple, but it additionally has a name for every component of it. Okay, so we can make color a name tuple of the name color, where the first element can also be accessed by the attribute red, the second element can be accessed by the attribute green, and the third element can be accessed by the attribute blue. 
And then uh, if we look at the dog string of that, it tells us where this is color, which has what we can do. So if we assign, we can now say yellow is a color with the values 255, 257, zero. And now we can get the wet component of this name tuple, not only by indexing it, this would work with a normal tuple, but we can also access it via, um, via uh, a name, by an attribute. This is just really handy. And if we print it, it even tells us how, uh, it even tells us what the name of the corresponding is. It's not, big or not that big of a change, it's just really handy. Okay, however, really important for Python are dictionaries. Uh, dictionaries you use when you have, um, where you want to ret retrieve things by their name. So you can index uh, dictionaries by their name, and then you get whatever was written in there. So you create a dictionary with the curly brackets, as we see here, and um, keys and values, it's uh, separated by colons, and the key and elements are separated by columns. Okay, we can simply add a new key value pair um, by just uh, by using the correct, using the index key and then the value value. And yes, there's no extent for, um, for um, dictionaries as there's for lists. However, since Python 3. Point something, I think it's even 3.5, it's pretty new, you can uh, create you can create a new dictionary from two dictionaries by using this syntax. So curly brackets and then two stars and then both of the um, dictionaries. It's basically corresponds to uh, extended lists. Okay, if something is not in there, so now we get to an important concept of Python, so we try to get decimators in meter that doesn't exist, so Python will pull a key over because there are no decimators in meter in this dictionary. So what we can do is we can check if this, is, this key is actually in there, and if so, we print it, and if not, we say it wasn't in there. Uh, alternatively, we could also use the dot .get um, with uh, a placeholder if it isn't in there. However, so this here, doing that, it's standard C syntax, you do it in C all the time, and it's called look before you leap. We look if that element is actually in there, and then we leap and use the element. Python, so Pythonic programming is not doing that. Python says it's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. So we don't look if the element is actually in there, we just try to access it, access it and if it's not in there, we just handle the error of it not being in there. This is a Python coding concept. So we can also try to get it, and if we get a key error, so we can just catch the exception we got, it, we got first, and if so, we do whatever else we want to do. Um, it says that it's a better coding style, at least for Python, so it's not better coding style for other languages, because in other languages, throwing exceptions is something uh, complex and uh, takes a lot of time, and Python is optimized, uh, so it doesn't change much, and it's just, um, other, so in using loop before a leak, it's just, it's just um, for the aesthetics. Here it looks like it's a special case if it's actually in there. And if you do it with uh, this syntax, um, it's both cases are semantically, aesthetically, um, equivalently relevant. So it can either be in there, it cannot be in there. It's just, just coding style, it doesn't change a thing. It's just a um, Pythonic way to do it. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Okay, if you have a dictionary and you want to get all keys, all values, or all items, which is keys and values, um, you can just uh, do that via the corresponding method. Okay, um, last of the standard collections in Python are sets. Sets are unordered collections of unique items, like sets in mathematics, and you can uh, declare them using, again, curly brackets. And the important thing about sets is that sets are unique. So if we add the three multiple times to a set, uh, it's only in there once. And you have to uh, empty sets, you have to declare um, explicitly with the explicit constructor because if you use empty curly brackets, well, you create a dictionary because that also uses curly brackets. Okay, um, set of, so sets are really practical and even though you may not think so, you will use them probably quite a lot because set has nice set operations. We can, set, we can easily find the union of two sets, the intersection, the difference, we can check if uh, something is a subset of the other, or a true subset by only using the smaller, and not the smaller equals. We can XOR, which will find elements uh, that are only in, the, only in one of them. So 
This here, the three is in there twice, so the extra there's not room in it. And sets are facet membership tests. So assume we have a set of uh, the numbers from 1 to 1,000, a list of the numbers from 1 to 1,000. We look if something is in there. Um, so the percent percent time it is just some IPython syntax to test. It runs the method a billion times and checks the average time. And if we do that uh, for a set, it will take 35 nanoseconds around 35 nanoseconds per loop per time we do this. And in um, doing the same with lists, it takes microseconds. So that's three orders of magnitude here faster. Why that? Because sets are internally done with a hash map, and you just have to hash the value and check it in there and not go through every single element. In list, you have to go through every single element. Yes? So what would constitute the upside of a list? Uh, that uh, you lists are ordered. You can have multiple, you can have the same element there multiple times in the list. And this is, but we need that in 90% of cases. Okay. Uh, how to make items in the list unique. Or we can just make a set out of that and then make uh, a list out of that again and now it's unique. Right? There was cheesecake twice in there, now it's not twice in there. I know, however, because sets are unordered, that now we destroyed the order. Okay. As much for those collections. Yes. Um, can there be, yeah, there can be multiple types in a, list, uh, in a set too, right? You can have a set of cheesecake yes. one and two. Yes. And also, like, all the collection types. Yeah. Okay. Any object. And because everything is an object, everything. <laughs> uh, console structure of real if and else, well, it's pretty straightforward. We don't use code of in Python, but we use um, white spaces, as you probably all know, if you did the first uh, exercises. Uh, but what's important is uh, truthiness. You can test any object for truthiness, and just some certain types which are uh, uh, have the truthiness false. So none, if you check for if none, it's false. If you check for if false, it's obviously false. If you check for a number and it's zero, it's false. If you check for a sequence and it's empty, it's false. Mapping's empty and it's false. And if you have your own class, which returns zero for len class, then it also returns a false. So what that means is here, if I, if empty list or false or none or zero or empty string, so if one of them would evaluate had the truthiness too, then we would print this here. As we don't print this here, obviously all of them are had the truthiness false, are falsey. Okay, however, while they have, while they are falsey, yeah, they interpret as false, they are not all false. So the empty list is not the very, it's not even equal to false. Interestingly, uh, Zero is equal to false because Python internally represents a Boolean as an integer. However, zero is false, would return false. Yes? Is it possible to convert the integer to Boolean as well? Like if you write Boolean zero, then it would like return false? So well, you, you can even do that. So, uh, I mean, you don't even have to do that because one is true and uh, two is uh, zero is false. So it's the very same thing. You can just uh, can just two uh, plus one is two. Sure. Okay. I have conditional assignment. Um, if you so, if you say uh, we have something which is falsey, for example, in empty list. And we assign it to a variable, and we, say we use the or, and then something else. Then if the first thing is falsy, we still assign the second. If it wouldn't be falsy, we wouldn't assign, we wouldn't assign second. So in this case, um, we assign the second one, this thing after the or, and if it wouldn't be falsy, we just assign the original one. Also, you use that more often than you think. Uh, in Java, there's a switch case. In Python, there's not, however, there's elif. In the end, if you write switch, case one, case two, case three, or you simply write if one, LF two, LF three, it just boils down to the same thing, right? Okay, ternary expressions. In Java, that would be B, <coughs> so we assign to B, hello, if number equals one, LF five. And in Java, you would, like, you would do it like this. In Python, you just, if number equals one, so is if number equals one, else R. So this here 
This is like the perfect situation when you use uh, turning expressions, for example, if you want to print, prettily print uh, plurals. So now we use the R and the grams. And now we use the is and the gram. Yes? I've just got a quick question. What would be my um, nice way to do, um, like, if I want to check for two conditions, have an if um, clause and then in that another if clause, or if? <laughs> um, it depends on uh, how long your line gets in the end. So it depends on what is um, what provides more overview. However, if you have the um, so, for example, if um, So if you have uh, if condition with an end, that's the same as in Java, if the first already evaluates to false, then you don't even get to the second. So if in the end, it's, it, it can probably even map to the very same thing. Once interpreted, I don't know of that, uh, but I, I don't think there's much of a difference, except you don't want your line to become too long. Yeah. Yes? Uh, why do you write the if behind the is, the er before the r? Because Python wants readability. This value is two if condition else. So that's exactly how you speak. Because Python wants to be as readable as possible. Loops. Um, we have the normal while loop. While condition, repeat whatever you want to repeat. So while this here is not numeric, I simply have to type it again and again. And if it's numeric, I'm done. As you may have noticed, there's no do while loop in Python. Uh, but it's very, very easy to emulate. You just have an infinite loop, then you have the actual body, and then if whatever our condition for the do while would be anywhere, we just break, exit out of the loop. Um, I heard some time in the past that break is considered dirty um, programming, and Python is just not. So we have the same condition here. We only, we didn't use, need to initialize this input here before. So in this case, a do while loop on Python, a while true. Break loop would be more appropriate. Yes. Um, could I, instead of writing uh, if number if is true, could I just write if number? Yes. Did I do that somewhere? What What do you mean? How can you write if number here? There's no if number. No. Uh, on the upper oh, example, um, was, uh, yeah. So in, instead of writing. Yes, I could have done that too. Sure. Uh, no. Wait. I couldn't have done that because. 2 also evaluates to 2. Only 0 is evaluated to false. 2, 3, 4, 5. And you want to have if it's exactly 1, and not if it's 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5. So that would print the, the, the uh, plural for 0 and the singular for everything else. Do you get what I mean? There's one gram, so singular. So like I said, we use the plural for 0 here. No, we don't. Oh yeah, I didn't do that here. Um, that was my general question. I'm not, I, I didn't exactly. It didn't make. It doesn't make sense here, but generally, of course, it can. Because in an integer has a two thingness. An integer evaluates to two if it's not zero and to false if it's zero. Okay, but everything else in zero is true. Yes. And in negative numbers also. Yes. Okay. The two thingness of an integer is only false for zero. OK, um, there's no Java-style for loop. Um, the for loop in Python is actually for each loop. And for each loop is much better than a for loop. Why that? Because well, a for loop is actually pretty easy. If you have, it's pretty simple. If you have in Java a for loop, simply have assign a variable, have a condition, and do something every time um, in every iteration of the loop. And that just corresponds to these three lines. So why would we need to implement a for loop, a normal for loop, if we can just emulate it with three lines of a while loop? In Python, the for loop is, however, much more capable and much more important, because in Python, every for loop is for each loop. And to understand what a for each loop does, uh, the concept of iterate is very important. So, yes? What is the, the benefit of using this while structure in, instead of using the normal for each loop with the range function? 
Uh, there's none. I just wanted to show you that it's superfluous to implement a photo. Um, so let's get to iterators. Uh, iterators, so what an iterator, so what we do in for loops is we iterate through something which is iterable. So for i in group in this iterable, lists are iterable, and it just goes through every single element and prints them. A string is also iterable, it just will print character by character. So collections and strings are iterables. Iterables provide the ability to iterate through them. Or explicitly to an iterator. We can check if something is an iterator by using by checking if it has the attribute iter. Is that good coding style in Python? No, it's not because it's uh, look. It would have been look before you leap. And in Python, we just try to do it, and if it throws an error, we just catch it by error. Uh, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Okay. So iterators have. Uh, so if something is an iterator then we can call the function iter on it. And that returns then an iterator. So this, this x is an iter in iterator generated by that, and it's of type iterator. And if we now, and iterators have the function next defined on it, and we find next on an iterator, it returns the next um, element of that. Okay, so what will this loop return? What will this loop print? Yes. One to five? No, we're not. It only prints two to five. Okay. By that, because we already advanced the iterator here once. So the iterator is now at this point. Iterators in Python are one time use, and as soon as we exhaust it, it's exhausted. So we don't, we don't get the value from before. Um, yes. And if we now print, uh, if we now try to execute next x again now, uh, we get a stop iteration. This is a certain kind of exception. So what a for loop in Python does is it makes an iterator out of an iterable, and then calls next all the time until it gets um, a stop iteration, and then it simply ends the loop. Okay, many built-in functions accept iterators as arguments. So we make x an iterator out of a list one, two, three, and then print, and then uh, make a list out of it again. Uh, the result is one, two, three. What, the, what will the result of this here be, of some x? Yes. Zero? Yeah, zero, nice. Because we already used it. We would have to recreate this iterator again. We would have to write x equals iter here again and then press and then make the sum function uh, because then it wouldn't be used anymore. Uh, if you want to use iterators multiple times, you have to make sure you make deep copies of it. Otherwise, you will exhaust them and then you won't be able to use them anymore. So, so there's no reset? There's no iterator reset. no. Iterators are one-time use. There are other things than iterators, and what they are, we'll explain next week, generators, uh, which have a reset function, but iterators don't. Okay, and now range is simply an iterator. So range six gives me an iterator from one to five. And this is different in Python 3 than, Python, than in Python 2, because in Python 2, the range function returned a list. In Python 3, it doesn't anymore, and it's simply an iterator. So if I print range 6 itself, it tells me it's a range, and the type of that is iterator. I think. Oh, it's range. Range is a certain iterator. Okay, but what I can do with that, with ranges, I can just go through them, iterate through them, because they are iterators, iterables, and just print everything a value. I can start ranges at a certain value. I can have ranges that have, um, that have a step size, and so on. Note that also in Python, some, something else here. Um, in Python, we don't, have, um, uh, we don't have the scopes as we have in Java. So in Java, if we would have done it done like this, Outside of the loop, I wouldn't exist in Python just because scopes are just not that important. And yes, range is in fact an iterator. How do you know that? Because it has an attribute iter. Okay, in Python 3, uh, because range is an iterator which creates new values on the spot, we can make a range until this dot max size. So if there would be a list, it would be a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, until 2 to the power of 64 divided by 2. Python 2 would take forever 
to create the list and probably get a memory error because your ROM is not big enough. In Python 3, that doesn't matter because luckily it's not a list, but um, a range. So this here is perfectly fine in Python 3. You can just make a for loop until max size and then have a break condition here. And now this is uh, what you asked, Moritz. This is basically uh, the same as a, for, a normal for loop. Yes. Um, it's just, it gets reassigned. For i in, just, defi just defines i as whatever the result of the iterator is at this point. Yes? So I can't read that the iterator, but I can still ask for the range from zero to something, right? You can ask for the range from zero to something, yes, but uh, that will give you a new iterator, in every t a new iterator object in every time. No, I never use the same one. I always create a new one. This year creates one, this year creates another one, this year creates another one. I never use it. Oh, okay. I think range may also be generated, so it may be reset by much more right now. But we'll get to that next week. Yes? Uh, what's the difference between using uh, just max size and uh, just writing a pen in the without the if phrase? Uh, that if you use system, if you just did it with a 10, the break condition would be at the beginning. This here is basically the condition where the break is at the end. I just showed you that it's possible. In Python 3, you wouldn't be, execu you wouldn't be able to execute this because the range into a system of max size isn't possible in Python 2. At least not with my 16 so far. OK, uh, next up for loops, you can have the keyword, uh, you can have a function, so the function enumerate. And what enumerate simply does is it gives you additionally an index like the classical for loop. Okay, um, important thing, if you're iterating through a list, you're iterating through an iterator created by that list. And because of that changing values of that, done doesn't change the actual list. Okay, we're making an iterator here out of that list, and if we want to redefine it, well, we redefine this iterator, but this iterator gets thrown away afterwards anyway, so it didn't. Uh, to do that, we just have to use the concept of the original for loop, and uh, iterate until a certain number. So this is like a real for loop. So now i is a number, and we index grades at a certain point, and then we can change it. Grades at the position, whatever here is, is changed, and now we did change it. Just. to call the loop function on it, that should work. Okay, making functions. Um, well, we can make functions, obviously. We do it like this, and now we made our own ones. So the type of what we just created is a function, and we can call it with some parameters, and it will return a value. Okay, if a function doesn't return anything, it implicitly returns none. We had that already. It's a really useful function. Um, in fact, Python, you obviously don't have to specify return value or void. And thanks to tuples, as we had before, we can even return multiple values. So this returns a tuple, number minus one, number plus one. OK, uh, doc strings. If something in three quotation marks is at the first line of a function, then it's a doc string. And then we can access it by typing function name question mark. Or pure doc string by function name dot underscore underscore doc underscore underscore, even though this is not something we should actually do. Okay, uh, we can have default arguments. So all arguments must be present except in our default arguments. If we have default arguments, they don't need to, we don't need to specify them. And if we don't, they're just whatever this here is. And otherwise, we can overwrite it. Okay, now there's a distinction between, oh no, that is too far. Call by value or call by reference. Um, Python is neither. Uh, there's no clear name on how we would call how parameters are given to Python. Um, it can't call it call by co reference. Let's call it call by object reference somehow, because we call it with an object. The only difference now, again, is if that object is mutable or not. OK? So if we give it an object, and, we, and if that object is mutable, which a list here, um, if we give it a list, which we do here, 
Then we can then we change that object, and the object is also changed outside of the function. We gave it an immutable, um, like a string, that wouldn't work, and we would create a new name inside the scope of the function, which happens to have the same name as the outside one, and we just assign the new object to the name inside the function and leave the original one unchanged. Um, we have again a caveat with a default argument. We have again a caveat if we use lists here, similar to then if we create lists with the um, time syntax, because if we have a default argument, which is an object, we use the very same object uh, for every single um, call of the list. Okay, so if we now uh, iterate through the list, we append something to the very same object all the time. So here we create, we, we think we create a new list with a new default argument, but it uses this very same argument all the time, and it thus makes the list longer and longer, which is unintended behavior in most of the cases. I don't know why the list. Um, but how we can solve that, we can uh, use the default argument none and overwrite it inside the function, and then it will create a new object every time we call the function. And now it works. If we now call it, uh, it works as we would hope it does. Right. Good. Then, as mentioned above, a Python function can have arbitrarily many arguments. How that? Because Python has the star operator. Okay, we can make a new function called scream, which takes an arbitrary number of strings, and they are collected with inside this star strings. And strings now is um, a tuple. We can have so the, what the star operator does, it takes arbitrarily many arguments and makes a tuple out of that in functions. So what I can do here is I can just uh, well make everything here upper and then print it and then we can scream, hey you, well it uh, makes all of them uppercase and we can have arbitrarily many, arbitrarily many arguments. Okay, um, we can use this syntax star something together with normal variables. We just have it after the normal variables and before the keyword arguments. Okay, so this function here takes first the separator. We always have to give that. There has to be a separator. Then we take as many arcs as we want. Um, and then we get the, and then we assign here the keyword arguments. If we only had two here without that part, um, it would assume true as one of those star arcs. Okay. Okay, the star star operator, double split, I don't know how to call it, works the same way only for keyword arguments. Okay, if we give, if we call the function um, with star arcs and star star arc, keyword arcs, um, where the, all the normal arguments, this is a list, are then inside arcs, now the keyword arguments, where we can have arbitrary names here, this is the only, one of the only situations where we can have arbitrary names, um, gets to uh, keyword, uh, comes the dictionary keyword arcs. As we see here, the type of it is um, dictionary. And then here we can access these by keyword arcs. And then we can uh, look for something in there. If something in there. Okay, um, the reverse situation we have in, uh, if we have already something as a list or tuple, and we have a function that needs more arguments, then we can simply use the star in the function call, and it will unpack them into the function, and now it has three, uh, it has two arguments, namely the three and the six, and not one list of arguments. Okay? Um, Yes, you can also just provide lists of dictionaries as arcs or keyword arguments. So we can create a dictionary beforehand, unpack that here, and we can make a list beforehand, unpack that here, that works the same way. So that now is for loop, our function here. We unpack, so we pack them, we unpack them here, and we pack them here again into keyword arcs. I need to wash it a little now because I want to get to the part which you need for the homework. Uh, one of the parts you need for the homework is uh, zip. The zip function, 
zips uh, multiple lists. So the zip takes as arguments um, two or more lists, yeah, and when it zips them, it makes so it, it uh, as the first so it, it rearranges them such that the first element of all lists belong of all its arguments belong to the other seconds and the, and the second yeah. elements and the third elements and so on and so on. So take a number of iterables, list of tuples, and create a new list containing tuples of all first or second or third etc. elements. Um, that makes sense, for example, if we have um, Cartesian coordinates here and we want to use all the x values. So we get this here is a point, x, y, another point, x, y, another point, x, y. And if we want to get all the x values, we can just zip them. And if, we, and if this function here, imagine the function is a list of x and y's, we just zip them here, use them as argument, and then it gives us a list, um, in this case, a template for instance. Yeah. Can I zip three lists? Yeah. It takes an arbitrary number of iterables via the uh, split operator. What happens if these lists are of different lengths? I don't actually. It just goes to the shortest list, it ends with the shortest list. Yeah, okay. It ends with the shorter list, shortest list. So you can that here from multiple lists, as we see here, and so on and so on. Okay, I mentioned already before that the fact that print is a function provides the advantage that we can overwrite it. We just make a new function which takes arbitrary arguments um, and then takes, for example, the, the normal arguments here, which are supposed to be strings, um, makes all of them uppercase, and then calls the inbuilt print function with those new arguments and the, it just uh, uses the original keyword arguments. Then we can define a function myprint that is the same that uses the same parameters as the normal print, but it has an additional keyword argument do screen, which is standard set to false. And if if this is true, then it uses our screen function, and if it's not, it uses the original built-in function. Now, from now on, on, and for now, we define the original print function as my function, which I can do. Because it's a function, we can, it's a name for a function, we can redefine that. And if I now do that, I can use the do screen in all of my prints. So whenever I printed something before, I can now um, scream it instead. Isn't that awesome? Oh, do scream, I thought it was. Hmm. I can do that. I thought it, oh, did I? Okay, now it should work. That's already quarter two. Uh, hmm. Okay, uh, that's unfortunate because I didn't get as far as I wanted to. What do I do now? Uh, for the homework, so if you can stay like 10 minutes longer, then we will get at least to the stuff you need for the homework. Is that okay for you? Okay. So we'll just do the console stuff next week. or the, the, We will do the console stuff in the tutorial, I'd say. Uh, so this took way longer than expected and then uh, when I did it alone. What you need here is classes and magic methods. So. Python is in part object oriented. Actually, in fact, I will just get to the part which you will need. And that is where you have classes, obviously, which uh, inherit from objects, and you can say what else they can inherit from. And now here, if I create a new class of type my class, it's of type my class. Okay? Uh, you can add attributes, so that much is so. Now, if I check if the class is of instance my class, uh, it returns true because, well, I created it of my class. And if I type um, an object of the class and then the question mark, it will tell me the doc string of my class, which I created here. So class is of doc string two, and you should use them because I will use them. Uh, classes have methods and attributes, and every attribute inside a class, uh, which you just define somewhere in the corpus of the class and not inside a method, um, is an, uh, um, not an instance, it's a class variable, not an instance variable. That behaves weird. So if you want to have instance variables, which are 
bound to the instance of a class and not to this class itself, and you have to define that inside a method. The constructor in Python is, in Java, it's called the same name as the class. In Python, it's called underscore underscore self underscore underscore. Okay. Um, that doesn't matter for you. Inheritance also doesn't matter for now. So. What's important for you for the homework is the Python data model. We already used operators before. We had one plus one. That's an operator. How do operators internally work? Internally, um, all objects, for example, an int, had methods in there. Because we showed that already. If I use dear one, it will tell me all the methods that a class has. And those double underscore methods are called, um, uh, are called magic methods, or well, uh, dunder methods, double under. And those are used for operators. So if I type one plus one, because one and one are both ints, it's the same as doing int dot underscore underscore add one and one. So what Python does here in operators is simply syntactic sugar for those dunder methods. Okay, if I type a equals three plus three, it will look the first one, aha, it's an int. Just, and then there's the operator plus. Plus is syntactic sugar for the method underscore underscore add underscore underscore. So it looks that the in class have an underscore underscore add method. And if it does, it will use that. And if it doesn't, it will throw an error. Um, and that's most of the syntax is done with those magic methods. For example, we have the plus operator. It uses the, like I said, the add one. We, had, we have other operators, we have the logical and, which uses the underscore, oh, underscore, and magic method, and so on and so on. Also, for example, if we tested the length of a list, we had len list, what it internally did, it called list dot underscore, underscore, len underscore, underscore. Same for string. So the object list has a uh, method, underscore, underscore, len underscore, underscore, and if you, um, if you use len list, then what it simply did, it used the method which is defined in the object list to get to return a value which corresponds to the length of the list. And if you want to implement your own classes that behaves the same way as inbuilt do, what you need to do is you need to implement these magic methods. So imagine we have a class, oops, imagine we have a class called list here, and we want uh, to be able to print it. Print, as I said, internally calls string and then the uh, the object and string and then the object internally calls the dunder method string of the object so if i now create this dunder method string and if i print something of an object of that type um, i will print whatever i defined here so if i say if i have another letter here it will print that okay um, and now we get to the, um, what was the difference between das gleiche und dasselbe, between the equals equals and the is. So first of all, what will A equals B return? It will return false because equals equals is called, calls internally the dunder method EQ because I didn't define it, doesn't know what to do and something returns false. I need to, ref I need to define the dunder method EQ, EQ for my triple class in order for this operator to work. Um, same holds for the in. In internally calls get item or um, uh, contains, the dunder methods get item or contains, and if they're not in there, well, it's not an iterable. And that's the issue in Python. Uh, I can check if something is an iterable, either by looking if it has the underscore, underscore, um, Peter underscore underscore um, that would look if this class actually has this dunder method which is necessary to call this function or I could just try and look at it which would be look before you leap versus um, uh, it's easier to ask for forgiveness and permission so if we want to have the behavior of our class allowing to use the equals then I have to implement the dunder method eq 
want to implement the behavior that I can check if something is in there, I have to implement the Dunder method contains. Okay? Now the difference between equals equals and is is that is checks if it's the same object, if it's at the same memory address, and equals equal and equals equals uses simply the dot eq, the Dunder method eq, which we provided for this object. Okay, now we get to duck typing in there. Next week. Okay. Um, that should actually be it for your homework. I will just go through those examples next week if you're fine with that.